Today we discuss two rules for derivatives. The product rule, which is when you want to take the derivative of a product of two functions, and the quotient rule, which is when you have one function divided by another and you would like to find the derivative. Okay, what is the product rule? Well, it goes like this, first times derivative of the second plus second times derivative of the first. And personally me, I say that to myself every single time I have a product, okay? Now, maybe let's look at the example that we saw in yesterday's video, which was x squared times x minus one, okay? We found this just by multiplying through x squared and then using the power rule on each term, which is perfectly fine, but let's just check. So we found that this derivative was, let's see, 3x squared minus 2x, okay? And let's just check this using the product rule. Or maybe I'll do that here, product rule. I get the first, here's the first, here's the second. Okay, first times derivative of the second. Well, the derivative of x minus one is just one, and then plus the second times derivative of the first, derivative of x squared to x. And now you see, this is 1x squared and 2x squared makes 3x squared, and then we have minus 2x. So this matches what we found just by distributing the x squared across the parentheses. Okay, now for the quotient rule, again, I say the same thing every time I write down a quotient rule. It goes like this denominator times derivative of the numerator minus numerator times derivative of the denominator all over denominator squared. Okay, I've been saying that to myself for, let's see, over 20 years since I first learned the quotient rule. And Every time I say the whole thing, even though it's a lot of words, I will say denominator times derivative of the numerator minus numerator times derivative of the denominator all over denominator squared. Now, I have heard some other things like low d high minus high d low over, I don't know, low, low, low or low squared. But for me, I like my way of saying it. So you can remember it however you want, but it's important that you understand there's a minus here, whereas in the product rule there's a plus, and also that first you have denominator times derivative of the numerator. And in, in the product rule, if you flip the order, if you wrote this first and then this, well, it'd be the exact same thing because you have a plus. But in the quotient rule, if you flip the order, if you write this one with a minus and then this one, it's not the same because, well, it's a minus, okay? So this is the quotient rule. Now, let us do this example. This example I was unable to do yesterday. We had x squared over x minus one. Well. Denominator times derivative of the numerator minus numerator times derivative of the denominator all over denominator squared. Now this we could definitely simplify some, but let me start right now. Maybe I'll get out of the way of both of these and make this comment. Typically, the question always comes up how much do I simplify? And we will definitely have ones on exams, quizzes like this, where I will tell you do not simplify, but a good rule of thumb is 
simplify as much as you need to to solve the problem you are given. So for example, if all I need to do is calculate the derivative, really there's no problem like this, although I will simplify another step in a moment. But if I need to set a derivative equal to zero, I might take some steps to make it a little bit simpler looking to be able to solve for x, for instance. Or if I'm gonna take a second derivative, sometimes I will simplify my derivative just to make the process of differentiating again simpler, okay? So my advice is just simplify only as much as the problem requires and don't necessarily try to simplify like crazy every time because if you simplify and you have simplified incorrectly, I have to take off points. Whereas if you don't need to simplify and it's correct, unsimplified, then you don't lose points, if that makes sense. Here though, let's do, just because it's our first example, this is 2x squared minus 2x minus x squared over this and maybe one more step i have x squared minus 2x over x minus 1 squared this is about as simple as we can make it here um, but an important thing i will say is for instance this x minus 1 you can definitely not cancel with one of these x minus ones because um, this is only multiplied by this first term. You can't cancel across a fraction like that. Okay, now, before I do some more examples with product rule, quotient rule, I'd like to just mention what are these rules not? A common misconception is that the product rule would be this. You just differentiate the first times differentiate the second, this is not correct. And then a common misconception here is that you would differentiate the numerator divided by differentiate the denominator, and this is not correct. And maybe to see this is not correct, let's do some maybe elementary type examples where you can definitely see that this is not the right rule. So for example, if I differentiate x squared to x, right, we know. But if we, we could also write this as x times x. Now this, this incorrect product rule would say just take the derivative of the first, take the derivative of the second, and, and while we see in this example, this cannot be the formula because the derivative of x squared is not one, okay? And similarly, let's do one over here which would illustrate that just f prime divided by g prime is not correct at all. So let's take, for instance, the derivative of x squared over x, okay? x squared over x is x, okay? We know this, properties of exponents. The derivative of x is one, very nice. But using this incorrect rule, we would get, let's see, derivative of the top over derivative of the bottom, and definitely not, okay? The derivative of x is not 2x. So hopefully you see with these examples where I just wrote powers as either a product or a quotient, you will realize this and this are not correct, and hopefully you don't make that mistake. Now, for the product rule, at the very end of this video, I will prove it using the limit definition in case you're interested. But what we really need for both the product rule and the quotient rule is to be able to use them to calculate derivatives. Let's find an equation of the tangent line to this function at x equals four. Well, I could multiply this out, first outer, inner, last, and use the power rule on each term, but I'm really trying to practice the product rule. And so in order to find the slope of the tangent line, which we know is the derivative evaluated at x equals four, I'm gonna use the product rule on this function. Okay, so we will calculate the derivative. 
This is my first, this is my second. So it's first times the derivative of the second is minus 2x, and then plus the second times the derivative of the first, well, we have two times 1 half x to the minus 1 half. Now, about all I'm going to do, again, simplify only as much as you need to for the problem that you're given, is I'm just going to just simplify this last term. Everything else I will leave alone because I can evaluate, oh, I can evaluate this at 4 as is. So this is, it's 1 times 1 over square root of x. Okay, so then we have the derivative. The slope of the tangent line is the derivative. Evaluate it at 4. This is 1 plus 2 times 2 times minus 8. And then plus, let's see, 2 minus 16 is negative 14 times 1 half. Okay, and now I work a little more. This is 5 times minus 8 minus 7, negative 47. Okay, this is the slope of my tangent line. It's the instantaneous rate of change of this function at x equals 4. Well, just as a comment, we see it's negative, okay, decreasing. So then I need a point, okay, and the point on the graph and on the tangent line is 4 comma f of 4. So let's calculate f of 4. This is 1 plus 2 times 2, and then 2 minus 16. This gives me 5 times minus 14, which is minus 50 and minus 20, negative 70. Okay. Now we have, oh, I'll write it here, 4 comma minus 70. This is my slope. This is my point. Okay, now I'm ready to write an equation of the tangent line. So we have y plus 70 is negative 47 x minus 4. This is an equation for the tangent line to this function at x equals 4. Here's our next example. We want to find the first and second derivatives for this function. And we clearly see a quotient here is one function divided by another function. So the first derivative, we have denominator times derivative of the numerator. Well, the numerator has derivative 5 minus the numerator times derivative of the denominator. Denominator has derivative 3 all over denominator squared. Now, this goes back to my comment about simplification. If all I needed was the first derivative, I would just walk away. I would be finished. It's fine. This is the derivative. However, I need to differentiate again, and to make my life easier, I'm going to get this in the form where I am ready to differentiate. So here I have 15x minus 10, then I have minus 15x minus 12 divided by, well, for the moment, maybe I'll leave it like this, and then I'll make my comment. Um, so the numerator at this point is easy to simplify. I have 15x minus 15x, that adds to zero, and then I just have a negative 22. Maybe I'll write that. I'm 
I'm going to multiply this out. Maybe I'll do this here. So I have 9x squared minus 6 and minus 6 makes minus 12x and then plus 4. And the reason I have done this is so that I can differentiate again without having to use a product rule when I go to take the derivative of the denominator. Okay, now the second derivative. Now I have, well, denominator, maybe I'll write it this way for this part, times, well the derivative of the numerator is zero, and then minus the numerator times, now I'm gonna use this to differentiate the denominator, as I mentioned, otherwise I would have a product rule. This is 18x minus 12, and then all over denominator squared, so it's squared, squared. I personally would um, at least, because I have something times zero, I would probably write it like this. We have a plus 22, then we have 18x minus 12 all over 3x minus 2 to the fourth power. You could go further with this. You see, I can factor out a 9. No, I can't. I can factor out a 6 from this and from this. So I would have 22 times 6 times 3x minus 2 all over 3x minus 2 to the fourth power, and now you see, really, we have a cubed in the denominator. So this would be 22 times 6, 2 cubed. Let's see, me personally, I would stop here. That's fine, but really any of these are okay unless you're asked to simplify. One reason I wanted to write this here um, with the cubed in the denominator is because we will see next time, you see the first derivative is minus 22 divided by 3x minus 2 squared. And we can differentiate that another way called the chain rule, where we wouldn't have to do a quotient rule to find the second derivative. And when we do the chain rule, we'll see this next time, we would definitely see a uh, cubed power in the denominator. In this example, we are given that h and m are differentiable functions, and then we have h of two is zero, h prime of two is negative one, m of two is three, and m prime of two is negative four. We wanna find the value of the derivative of this quotient and this product at t equals two. So we're really just interested in t equals two here, and this is quotient rule, product rule. Okay, so at t equals two, what do we know about the quotient? Well, quotient rule. It would be denominator times derivative of the numerator minus numerator times derivative of the denominator all over denominator squared, except I meant to put a two. Now let us just fill in these values. We have the values we need and we just put them in their places. M of two is three, H prime of two, negative one, H of two, zero, m prime of two, negative four, and then m of two squared is nine. We get negative three over nine, or negative one third. Okay, now for this one, this is product. I'll write it here maybe, at t equals two, we have the first times derivative of the second plus the second 
times derivative of the first. And now, again, we fill in the values. We have zero times m prime of two, negative four, and then plus m of two is three times negative one, here we get negative three. So these are two answers here for the derivative of the quotient, derivative of the product, both evaluated at t equals two. This is an example that is part of a textbook exercise, but it's really great for us to work. But we are told the following, this is the surface area for a right circular cylinder, which would look something like this, with radius r and height h. And this cylinder is changing over time, so r and h are both changing over time. We wanna find an expression for the derivative of the surface area with respect to time. Maybe let me work with just the surface area itself for a moment before I jump into differentiating. So I can write this as a product of two functions if I just do some factoring. So let's write it this way. A of t is, well you see I can factor out two pi r, so this would be two pi r of t times r of t plus h of t. Okay, and I'm writing them as functions of time. This will help me when I differentiate. And now, if you look at this, we see first and second, we see a product rule, okay? So let's calculate this here. A prime of t, and I will show you another way we can write this once we do it this way, but a prime of t is the first, times, well what's the derivative of the second? Well we have a sum of two terms, this would be r prime of t plus h prime of t. So this is first times derivative of the second, and then plus, well the second, times derivative of the first, which is two pi r prime of t. Now, you notice I have written this with the prime notation. You could also write this another way. So first of all, this is an answer here. Perfectly fine answer. But how else could I write the exact same thing? We could write this as dA dt. This is two pi r dr dt plus dh dt, and then plus um, here, r plus h, and then two pi dr dt. Now we could group this slightly differently. This is correct, right? There's nothing wrong with it, but we could group this slightly differently. We could write, well, let's see, collect things like this. We have two pi r dr dt and another two pi r dr dt. This makes four pi r dr dt. Then we have two pi r dh dt and then the last term would be two pi h dr dt. So this is another way of just writing this exact same thing. And this one, and this, and this, they're all the derivative of surface area with respect to time, but I show both this prime notation and the DDT notation. I'm, I will do two more examples. One involves the product rule, and then one will involve the quotient rule. And here, we are given the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And we saw this come up in a homework in the last section. We are just given this and then we can use it. But I will say we will come back uh, in a few sections and spend a lot of time on 
the derivative of exponential functions. But for now, we just take this as given. We want to find all critical points for this function, x to the seventh e to the x, and classify each critical point as corresponding to local max, local min, or neither. Well, to find the critical points, we start with the derivative. So we have first times, well, derivative of the second, but the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and then plus the second times derivative of the first. We see this function exists everywhere. I mean, the domain of my original function was minus infinity to infinity, and certainly the derivative is defined on the whole real line. But to set this equal to zero, we can factor out what's common to both. I have an x to the sixth, I have an e to the x, and then I'm left with x plus seven. So this is my derivative factored, and now we see, well, this is zero provided x equals, when this is zero, we have x is zero, e to the x, and this is a really important comment, never zero. Okay, the graph of y equals e to the x always sits above the x-axis. This is always positive. So we don't have any solution setting e to the x equal to zero, then we get one here, negative seven. So these are our critical points. Okay, now I will use first derivative test where I have minus seven, I have zero, and then the intervals here are minus seven to zero, zero to infinity, and then minus infinity to minus seven. These would be, for instance, if I was asked for intervals of increasing and decreasing, I have the intervals here that I get by dividing the domain into intervals based on these critical points. And then I will test f prime of x, x. Then we have x to the sixth, e to the x, x plus seven, and then f prime of x. And I pick a point in each interval, maybe minus eight, maybe minus one, and one. And we test the derivative. So here I'll use one, minus one, minus eight. Positive, always positive, positive, derivative positive. This is positive, it's to the sixth power. Positive, uh, positive, it looks good, <laughs> positive. And then minus eight, positive, positive, negative, negative. Okay, here we have positive, positive, and negative. So if we make just around each critical point here at minus seven, we would be decreasing horizontal tangent, increasing. We see local min, I'll write it, local min, at x equals negative seven. But here, maybe I'll draw a separate picture for that. Right around zero, it's increasing, increasing. So whatever happens is increasing horizontal tangent, increasing. We do not have a local min or a local max there. We have no local extremum at x equals zero. Okay. Here's a graph of the function f of x is x to the seventh times e to the x. We just saw we have a local min at x equals negative seven. And similarly, at x equals zero, we had neither a local min nor local max. We do see horizontal tangent line at x equals zero, but since the function is increasing and then increasing again, we do not have an extreme point. 
Here's my last example of the day. We want to find all x values where the tangent line to this graph has slope 2. Well, we know the slope of the tangent line. That's the instantaneous rate of change at that x value. And it's also the derivative evaluated at uh, whatever x value you have. And so I want to find the derivative, set it equal to 2 and then solve for x. This is a quotient rule. y prime, well, we have denominator times derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times, well, the derivative of the denominator is minus 1, and then all over denominator squared. But since I will be setting this equal to 2, I will clean up the numerator just slightly. This is 2 minus x plus x over 2x, or excuse me, 2 minus x squared. And this is 2 over 2 minus x squared. So we want x with 2 over 2 minus x squared is 2. Or you can write this as 2 over 1. And so you see we must have that 2 minus x squared is 1. Now there's a few ways you can solve this. Way number one would be multiply everything on the left hand side out, subtract one. Now you have something equal to zero and you can refactor. I'm gonna do this in what I think is slightly an easier way. I have something squared equals one. So this, which is inside of the square, there's only two possibilities. So I know either 2 minus x is 1 or 2 minus x is negative 1 because those are the 1 and minus 1 are the two solutions to something squared <laughs> is 1. And here we get, let's see, x is 1 and here we get x is 3. So these would be my two answers here. The tangent line has slope 2 at x equals 1 and at x equals 3. The last one truly was my last example, but I mentioned at the start of this video I would come back and talk about the product rule using the definition. So if you are interested, you can keep watching. I will mention this is in the text also um, the text does the quotient rule using the definition by first finding the derivative of 1 over g of x and then f of x times 1 over g of x. But let's talk about this one, the product rule using the definition. Well, here it is. You take, if you want f times g prime, we would need f times g evaluated at x plus h minus f times g evaluated at x divided by h. And then we take a limit as h goes to zero. Now just staring at this, it's really not obvious at all what we're going to do. But there's a trick here that you can add zero and you get the same thing. Or you can multiply something by one and you get the same thing. So we will cleverly add zero here and it will help us. Okay, so, so I will keep what I have. And now, let me add zero in purple. I will take f of x plus h g of x minus f of x plus h oh, g of x. And then let me 
get a little more space here. So there was a minus. See what I have written in purple is zero. So I have not changed anything. But the beauty of doing this trick is I can rearrange things. This is a limit as h approaches zero of, well, let me add even more color to illustrate what I will do. I'm gonna take this and this one, okay? And I will put those two together, and then I will take this one and this one and put these two together. So here we go, we have f of x plus h, g of x plus h minus f of x plus h, g of x divided by h. And then now I add what's overlined in pink, so plus f of x, oh, pardon me, plus h g of x minus f of x g of x over h and this is close my parentheses now what's assumed here is part of the assumption of the product rule even though i haven't written it is that both f and g are differentiable and if they're both differentiable they're both continuous because differentiable implies continuous. So, well this first limit is, well I have an f of x plus h, and then I have g of x plus h minus g of x over h, and then I have a second limit. And this one I have a g of x and f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Now we are in absolutely wonderful shape because well, maybe I'll start over here. This, there is no h, okay? And this part is the difference quotient for f of x. We take a limit as h approaches zero of this, we get f prime of x. So here we see g of x, f prime of x, okay? Which is the second part of the product rule. And now back to this one. Remember I said these functions are assumed to be differentiable? Okay, of course, we need that for the product rule. And differentiable implies continuous. When you have a continuous function, you can bring the limit inside, okay? Which means the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h is f of x, okay? So this limit, this limit is f of x. This limit is the derivative of g. So we have f of x, g prime of x. And now you see, and this was using the definition, which is something that I don't do all the time once we get into all the rules, but for the product rule here, we see it.